Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Records Managers Online Forum. Uh, my name is Martin Killian. I'm the Director of Collections for New South Wales State Archives and Sydney Living Museums. Um, I, hopefully, I'm a somewhat familiar face to some of you. Certainly, some of the names that we have here this morning are well-known names to me. In opening the forum, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all meeting um, today from wherever you are meeting from and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. For me, it's the Darig people um, here at the Western Sydney Records Centre. Um, inevitably, uh, just some housekeeping before we make a start. So uh, while most people's phones, uh, sorry, most people's phones, while most people's cameras and microphones have been disabled, um, if anyone's camera is on, please be aware that the forum is being recorded. Um, so you could see yourself in lights at any stage. Um, but if you do leave your camera on and if there's any connection issues, um, sometimes shutting that camera off can um, help that situation. Um, as I said, the forum's being recorded um, and it will be published on our website and you'll be emailed um, the details of that recorded recording once it's uploaded. Um, of course, uh, there will be opportunity for questions throughout the forum. We are asking you to use the chat function for any questions um, so that we can um, have those come through in written form but also because this forum uh, is possibly our largest ever. We have over 400 registrants um, this morning. So um, no doubt about it, you put legislation in the title and it attracts just about everyone that you can think of. Um, so Al, can I get you just to show the agenda slide uh, for me? And we'll just run through that. So first of all, we're going to be talking about the establishment of State Records New South Wales and Museums of History New South Wales. Um, and that will be a briefing by our Chief Executive, Adam Lindsay, who I'll introduce in a few moments. Um, we're going to speak about specifically this morning, the changes to the State Records Act, um, which a number of you already will have received some preliminary advice on through For the Record. And then we'll also do some updates of what's been happening with us um, here at New South Wales State Archives. Um, I wanted to also uh, mention a couple of people before I hand over to Adam. Um, the first is Andrew Pickles, who many of you will be familiar with, was our Manager of Record Keeping Standards and Advice and also Collection Services. Um, Andrew has now left us to go to education. Um, so I would like to acknowledge his fine contribution to um, our record keeping policy framework um, implementation and the various initiatives that he drove forward um, through his time with us. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Mary Darwell. Uh, Mary has come uh, on board uh, with us for a short but great period of time as the director of the record keeping standards and advice team um, and Mary I might uh, get you just to say a few words about your background and, and so on before we get the, the proceeding started. Um, look thanks very much Martin and I'm really pleased to be here today at, at, at the first major record management forum um, in my time with SARA SLM. Look I'm really delighted to be here to be helping the team in this important time transitioning um, to become State Records um, New South Wales, you know, to continue their important work and to really lean into our responsibilities um, and our new opportunities that are presented by the Act, which and I know Adam will talk a little bit more about. Just by way of background of who I am, um, I, I'm a, what they call a seasoned chief executive across the um, public sector. So previous roles uh, I've held is I headed up Arts New South Wales for about um, seven years. And, and so in that time had responsibility for a range of arts and cultural matters, including um, relationships with the cultural institutions, which included at that time the Historic Houses Trust and the State Library um, Archives were sitting in a different portfolio at that uh, point. 
Most recently, I've been the CEO of the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, which is a Commonwealth statutory authority responsible for some iconic sites on Sydney Harbour, including Cockatoo Island, which participated in um, Open Sydney just on the um, on the weekend. But look, but prior to that, look, I'm a lawyer by training and I've worked extensively across government in different roles, including in the Department of Premiers and Cabinet and Economic and Regulatory roles. Um, and as such, I'm one of those people that is really passionate about the importance of government and of governments in, in how we approach uh, our decisions, of recording, supporting and making transparent to the public. Um, the things that we do um, in their name as, as um, a government. So that's a bit about me, and I'm really looking forward to meeting you all over the period of time that I'm here. Terrific. Thanks very much, Mary, and thanks very much for joining us um, this morning. Um, I'd now like to uh, pre introduce our first presenter, Adam Lint. Um, Adam is, as many of you will already know, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of New South Wales State Archives and Records and Sitting Living Museums. Um, Adam, for those of you who don't know, joined us at New South Wales State Archives in 2017, when where he and I first met, um, and he began leading Sydney Living Museums from July 2019, and since that time has led both organisations. Um, so double, double the amount of uh, work, um, but not double the amount of pay. Um, Adam, of course, um, has over 14 years experience um, in senior leadership roles, uh, both within government, um, within the, in various tiers of government, um, and also the cultural institutions. So, Adam, I will hand over to you and thank you in advance for making the time for this morning's forum. Thanks, Martin. Much appreciated. And uh, welcome, Mary, and welcome, everyone. It's fantastic to see these, these numbers and the number of registrations and attendees as well over 300 at this point. They might increase after I finish my presentation. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, to acknowledge traditional owners. I'm here on Gadigal land uh, underneath a painting uh, inspired by uh, a state record, in fact, a state record in the State Archives collection by a fantastic Aboriginal artist. Um, you have to forgive my camera. Uh, as of last week, it started moving of its own accord. So if it does start moving uh, during this presentation and anyone uh, is confronted or feels a little motion sickness from that, I apologise. I can't, I can't for some reason control it. But I'm going to share my screen now so that the focus won't be on me, will be on the presentation. And as Martin said, very happy to take questions um, to keep it to a really fashion. And please um, do so uh, via the chat. And I'm happy to uh, have them called out by Irene or a member of the, of the team. And I can answer them as we progress through this presentation. Um, I do want to make sure I'm covering what people want to know, noting that the subsequent presenters today will go into uh, a considerable amount more detail. But as, as I've also said, please feel very, very free to ask any question you like. So I'm here today to give an overview of State Records New South Wales, SRNSW, and Museums of History New South Wales, MHNSW. The first slide that I'm going to present of substance is one that many of you will have seen before. And if you haven't and are interested, we can circulate it or it is um, publicly available in the white paper that's been published on both our website and also the New South Wales Parliament website that discusses uh, the prospects and the legislative change from a policy and a legislative point of view in, in reasonable detail. So if you are interested and haven't seen that, please uh, look at it. Um, in the grey text at the top, it talks about the current legislative framework and the future legislative framework, and ultimately the State Records Act is amended, the Historic Houses Act is repealed, and the Museums of History Act is stood up. Uh, in the coloured boxes, uh, in the blue, you have Sydney Living Museums and the Historic Houses Act, which enables that institution. All of those functions migrate with very few, if any, changes into the Museums of History Act, which enables Museums of History New South Wales. In terms of the State Records Act, the current State Records Act, which ena enables SARA, or the State Archives and Records Authority, we've grouped their functions into two main uh, buckets. One is the record keeping policy and regulation. And secondly, is the custody of and access to the State Archives collection. And so they novate, they separate in terms of record keeping policy and regulation, which remains 
within the State Records Act and under the purview of the new Focused State Records Authority in New South Wales, or SRNSW. The custody of and access to the State Archives collection moves into being facilitated by Museums of History New South Wales. And so there's a fair amount of reciprocity in both pieces of legislation. The amended State Records Act, which confers functions both on State Records New South Wales in terms of record keeping policy and regulation, and on Museums of History New South Wales in terms of custody of and access to the State Archives collection. So in layman's terms, everything up, and to, up to our transfer is done by State Records New South Wales, and from transfer onward, that is done by Museums of History New South Wales. Um, I will also say that uh, there is a fair amount of cooperation happening now, obviously, because we've been working together for a long time, and systems access policy cooperation and even uh, reciprocity at a governance level is envisaged, whereby the Chief Executive of Museums of History New South Wales is uh, a board member of State Records New South Wales, um, so that the decisions, particularly around retention, that in the longest term uh, have an, an impact, a reasonable impact on the State Archives collection are done in a level of concert with the entity that will in future provide access to and have custody of, physical custody of, the State Archives collection. So as I said, that document and a, a, a more a detailed explanation is provided in the white paper that's publicly available. And if you do have any questions, please type them in, into the chat. Moving on from uh, that slide, we then talk about State Records New South Wales, a new statutory authority. Uh, and I will also later on in the presentation give an overview of Museums of History New South Wales, although I am conscious some of you might be less interested in that, but for completeness, um, I will go through both. State Records New South Wales, or SRNSW, is a new separate and dedicated agency for record keeping standards, regulation, advice, education and policy. And the cooperative regulatory approach that the team has developed, and Martin gave a, a well-deserved shout out to Andrew Pickles, um, but there's also many others, long-standing and new members of that team, including Martin, who's been the director responsible for that team for some time now, who've contributed to a really, uh, I think, step change, a maturity in cooperative regulation, guided by the board, and there's some fantastic members of the board that have helped guide that, including the Chief Executive of the IPC. And so a lot of the work uh, done in, in that team is done through co cooperation, standards, uh, the giving of advice, both specific and general, uh, specific being in response to queries that come in, flood in at times, uh, and general being through um, case studies and other pointers that are sitting on the website. And education, quite a lot of uh, information about the state of the sector is gained that helps us improve standards and policy and our advice through our education role. With all existing powers preserved, there are a number of important changes. And I think that this has been, uh, during the consultation process that's, that's gone for more than three years on these changes to the State Records Act, what's missed some stakeholders is, if it's not mentioned in the white paper or if it's not mentioned as a policy position that's being changed, it stays the same. So it's really important to note that all the existing powers, uh, particularly from a, a, a more um, hard regulatory point of view, the power for state uh, records, the current SARA, to be able to see any state record that they wish to held by a state, uh, by, a, by a public office, um, in order to assess compliance with the State Records Act. So. That still exists and all the other powers still exist, including the power to publish findings in annual reports. All of those current powers under the Act are retained, but there are a number of important changes that increase, uh, particularly the ability to, to monitor and regulate, but there are also some access changes as well. And I'll go through those in, in, in some detail now. Firstly, there's an additional power that state records will be conferred with a new monitoring power to require public officers to investigate their own record keeping practices when instructed. Now, the team's done a lot of work and have had um, a 
preliminary set of discussions internally uh, and with the board around all aspects of this power, uh, whether it is proactive or reactive or both, uh, what constitutes minimum standards for a person or people conducting such um, uh, uh, an investigation, uh, what constitutes minimum standards for a report back, and then what happens, particularly if SR and SW are not satisfied with the findings or the reporting. And so there are a number of mechanisms, uh, referrals, uh, cooperative powers that, that come into play here. But this is a, a huge step forward. And in evolving this policy with uh, over two ministers offices now, and, and also with a reasonable amount of consultation with public offices, uh, particularly in the CFO space, uh, with a mind to the future of, of record keeping investigations being largely driven through technology. Uh, and also a reasonably high profile example of where we have to use our current uh, powers to do a record keeping assessment of a high profile public office. Uh, this was determined as a cost effective but thorough uh, way in which SRNSW could both um, increase the uh, focus on cooperative regulation, insist that more is done when they have suspicion that record keeping compliance is not where it needs to be, whether that's through uh, their own investigations, uh, their own monitoring through complaints, or simply regular checks on certain more vulnerable or new aspects of formats, record keeping uh, standards, or new um, policies that come into play. So you can imagine the broad range of scenarios where this power may be used. Uh, and, and the team really are looking at this as not their first port of call, not their first uh, trigger to pull, but uh, an ability to work up to if the current way that we cooperate with monitoring people's compliance or public officers compliance fails to yield the results or fails to yield um, the comfort that SR and SW will need as the regulator in this space. Moving on from the power, uh, the, the introduction of the monitoring power into the access changes, there's two very, very important changes. The first is the records in the open access period will now be open by default unless they are subject to a closed to public access direction. And I'll go back to my previous comment. All current powers, not just for the state records entity, but for public officers, are retained. So public officers still retain the ability to set access directions, including closed access directions. And should they fail to do that or not wish to do that, the result of not having an access direction now is a record sits in limbo. The public have an unfettered right to uh, request an access direction to be put in place, and that is by law free, uh, but they don't know that those records are there to begin with. And so that's a very seldom used mechanism for the public under the Act. What this does is save an administrative task. If you intend something to be open, it can default open without you needing to set an open to public access direction. It saves members having to apply for an access, members of the public, I mean, to, to have to apply for an access direction to be put into place. And it also allows the spirit of open access and open government to be woven through and embedded in access changes. But I do want people to rest assured that there is no diminishment in the power of the public office to set a close to public access direction. And indeed, throughout the consultation with public officers, when we talked about these access changes, it was through being informed by public officers that we have agreed uh, that there will be a 12 month adjustment period or transitional period whereby SRNSW will work with uh, and MHNSW who facilitates the access will work with public officers to make sure that people are ready over the next 12 months before this comes into play as a, 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 an active part of the amended State Records Act. The second part of access change is, is um, one that's probably more familiar to most people and it's in line with the changes that the Commonwealth and other jurisdictions have made, is reducing the, the, the standard open to public access period from 30 to 20 years. Now, people often think of cabinet papers and that's, that's really the most visible and where the rubber hits the road. But ultimately, if you don't set a close to public access direction or provide earlier or special access, 
in the first 20 years of a record's life, it will default open after 20 years. And again, reminding everybody that there is that one year transitional period uh, that the teams in both entities will work with public officers to make sure that people understand these changes and, and more importantly, the implications of these changes so that there aren't any unintended consequences. In terms of transfer of state records, uh, there is a new power that public officers are required to make and implement transfer plans. I, I consider this possibly one of the biggest steps forward in terms of the collection management and safeguarding of uh, future state archives uh, and, and will be a vital power. I think one that as more records become digital, uh, one that will be looked back on as, as a very positive change to have introduced at this juncture. This, uh, the purpose of this, uh, amongst others, is to ensure that records of enduring value that are no longer in business use are identified and cared for. And it also assists in sentencing for disposal. And ultimately, once this is up and running and, and, and regularly embedded in people's business, uh, any records that are remain in the physical custody of, uh, of a public office uh, and under the control of um, Museums of History in New South Wales, uh, or even in the awareness of Museums of History in New South Wales, can be better planned for their eventual transfer. And that's really important when we talk about bespoke databases, uh, when we talk about uh, material that might be forgotten if it's stored off site. Um, so really what this does is allow a kind of proxy distributed management plan to sit in place with records that are on the radar of Museums of History in New South Wales, uh, but are kept in the physical custody uh, of the public office. I've repeated this a number of times, but I, I, I thought it was worthwhile putting um, this in a, an explicit and additional reminder that the 12 month period of transition before these changes come into effect is uh, already agreed and in place. And it starts on the 31st of December, uh, at which time both of the legislations that the amended State Records Act and the New Museums of History New South Wales Act come into um, uh, effect. Uh, and the transition before the changes that I've outlined, the transitional period is a further 12 months. So till 31 December, 2023. I'll now quickly go over Museums of History New South Wales, which is the 12 museums of Sydney Living Museums and the State Archives Collection, the custody uh, and access arrangements for both the general public on a singular or research basis, as well as the more curated museum style access. And I will go through this at a little pace so that um, we can stop for any questions that might have come through. The objects of the Museums of History New South Wales Act are as follows, to collect and manage and preserve the collection. Now the collection is the State Archives collection, the significant buildings and sites from the, the Mint, uh, uh, and the UNESCO World Heritage listed Hyde Park Barracks to smaller regional museums. And the objects and materials that are related often to those significant buildings and sites that are in the care of that entity. They are also responsible for increasing the public knowledge and enjoyment of that collection and providing access to that collection, noting that access with a capital A under the State Records Act has specific obligations uh, and standards attached to it, and they are equally conferred on the Museums of History New South Wales entity as the custodians of that collection. They're also responsible for promoting the knowledge and appreciation of history, and in particular, the stories that shape the social, historical, political, and cultural identities of New South Wales. And lastly, to achieve all of those objects across the state, including in regional and rural New South Wales. The organisation has a simple purpose to discover people, places and ideas through the shared stories of our state and the built heritage combined with the documentary archival heritage uh, means that there literally are billions of stories and it comprises that collection some of the most significant historical material in the country. There is a strong focus on not just physical access but also digital access so that 
the collection can be somewhat um, democratically available. Uh, that's one way of achieving that regional mandate at the end of the objects that I just outlined, but also um, continues the very strong interstate and even international uh, research community that often uh, sources material from the State Archives collection. And it really is not just about living in the past, it's engaging with the past, but doing so in the present and embracing all of the different technologies that, that allow us to proliferate more access and look at things in an interesting way and do it with a mind for the future. And that speaks not just to access, but preservation, which is a very, very important part uh, of SR and SW's job from uh, uh, the retention and disposal, which is aided and supported through sentencing at public office level, but then increases uh, uh, in, uh, in importance in terms of the long-term preservation as those archives and archival material get older and older. We're really here to put history before us and not behind us. The records of today are tomorrow's fascinating story. And I think that this set of policy changes show a slightly better through line, uh, particularly in terms of the shorter open to public access period from what you're creating today. Yes, we see it in the short term as part of the public discourse often politically or journalistically motivated. But after that open access period has elapsed, this becomes part of the unbroken record of New South Wales and, and uh, sits there in a, in a continuous um, narrative, government point of view narrative, um, but with a lot of elements of citizen science thrown in uh, as an unbroken narrative of, of this state. And the vision for the new institution is to make the history, stories and cultures of New South Wales discoverable and relevant for all, so that for First Nations and future generations, we offer new perspectives on old stories that keep the history of New South Wales new. And so offering a new perspective on that collection, uh, we have history and future interwoven. And so creating a home for history, which was the rationale for setting up Museums of History in New South Wales, and noting that this forum is more interested in record keeping, I think it is worthwhile saying that the original place for this vision at the ministerial level was to get increased use, not just of the phenomenal State Archives collection, but to tell new and different stories in the somewhat then static uh, 12 museums of Sydney Living Museums. Uh, and the Minister of the Day and then subsequent governments and stakeholders have seen that, that partnership um, as very, very uh, strong and fruitful. Um, and initially it was envisaged that the regulatory part that we spoke about earlier that's, that's now becoming SRNSW would, would form part of that entity. But in examining the evidence given at the Social Issues Committee's inquiry and the number of hearings and, and submissions that they uh, took on this as a prospect, it was qu quite clear that a number of expert and general stakeholders felt that a more focused agency to support government record keeping uh, was a, a safer, better and uh, I suppose, more acceptable outcome, which is why we've ended up with museums of history focusing on collections and access and uh, SRNSW focusing on record keeping. And so history really gathering people, not dust. And that is one of the key phrases of the Museums of History, New South Wales. And I thought I'd end on a positive note. The future is exciting. Say thank you and see whether there's any questions that anybody has, of course, Chair and timing permitted. Thanks very much, Adam. I'm just checking the chat. Um, I can see that we've had a crowd uh, sourcing solution to hearing and audio problems from various people um, throughout that. Um, and we've just got one question that's come up about from Kathy about whether there's any planned initiatives to align access directions for public, custom, public sector customers. Um, for example, every staff and personnel record. We might leave that one until Christie's presentation a little later. Um, there is the question from Caroline about uh, uh, who's responsible for the government records repository. Thank you so much for that question. And I, I should have mentioned that. I meant to mention that in, in the very first slide that I showed. Um, Museums of History New South Wales will be responsible for the government records repository. 
Um, the rationale for that is, is reasonably simple and practical. The Government Records Repository conducts its business out of the space uh, that was generously given to the State Archives Collection, uh, and we use that to provide those ancillary and supplementary services, both for profit, to subsidise uh, the care for the collection, uh, all money is reinvested back, but also to aid standards uh, in public offices for record keeping. So ultimately, there was never any question wherever the collection goes and the collection storage area, the government records repository goes. Good, great. Uh, and look, Jane has asked again a, a question around specific around the transfer plans around whether that includes um, things such as antique furniture and so on. And again, I think we'll defer to Christy for that one in the interest of time. Um, and look, I have to say, while just giving people a final opportunity to ask any questions, um, some of us on this call, uh, notably me, uh, was around at the time the State Records Act um, of 1998 was planned, um, introduced and implemented. And very much the spirit of that act was to improve the state of record keeping um, across uh, New South Wales um, and the, the jurisdictions that we that we cover. And this legislative change, uh, I think at the heart of it, is a further step in that improvement um, through, as you've mentioned, the separating out of the record keeping regulation and compliance function to um, giving people uh, uh, certainly a, a requirement around having more of a visibility around records of enduring value that should be transferred to the state archives and providing that greater public accountability and transparency through uh, access to uh, public records earlier um, and a default position around that access being made rather than, than not being made. So I think, um, you know, it's it's almost full circle for me, but a great step forward um, as well in terms of our overall evolution. Um, Jeanette has asked about distributed management plans. Uh, so, Jeanette, there are no changes to the distributed management provisions of the State Records Act, so those remain in place. Um, it's an area that I think we do need to do some work in that will fall to uh, Museums of History New South Wales. It's part of part four of the Act, so it will be um, it will form part of our work on this side of the fence. Um, Caroline has asked a follow-up question around additional resources to assist the regulation and oversight. Um, uh, Adam, I don't know whether you want to take that question. I'm happy to do so. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. We're discussing that at the moment, Caroline. Part of it actually depends on where in the administration of government that they end up. There's still a number of options. Initially, uh, SRNSW will be staying in, in DEET, in the Department of Enterprise, Industry and Trade. Uh, but but you know, we are having ongoing discussions about whether that is the long term plan for its administration or, or in the architecture of government. So that's a, it's a it's a watching brief at this stage. Uh, but Mary, I don't know whether Mary is going to share a little bit about the, the kind of plan that's that she's put together for the team. And there certainly is, you know, a need for additional um, additional funding, whether it's resources or outsourcing, or I don't know whether Mary's sort of drilled down into exactly how that's that's going to happen yet, but that is an ongoing discussion in short, Caroline. Mary? Uh, yeah, yeah, but I might just amplify that. Uh, um, a lot of the work that we've been doing with the team over the last few weeks has been looking at what it means to lean into our regulatory and educative responsibilities um, and, and which parts of government we're appropriate align, appropriately aligned with to be able to sort of amplify our our impact. So, so you will see a sort of a, a new sort of corporate plan for state records, New South Wales emerging when we we emerge from the chrysalis of, uh, on the first of of, of January and. Um, as you'd expect, we would be having the sorts of conversations that you have with government about how we can make sure the the promise that that we've made to the community about the impact of state records in New South Wales can be implemented. And there are a number of ways to do that. And part of the way that you do that is collaboration with agencies um, who have similar uh, remits of responsibilities. Um, so 
yeah, a, a watching brief, as Abby said. Yeah, great. All right, thanks for that question, Caroline. Great to see you online. One of the many familiar faces um, here today. So great, great to see you here. Um, Adam, there's no further questions. Um, so uh, I think we'll we'll let you go, but thank you again for your time um, this morning. Uh, very much appreciated to provide us with that overview, and we'll now spend time digging down into to more detail um, of Excellent. those provisions. So thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.